as well the exercise of excessive clapping. So right after I end, we can all put our hands together for all of them. We have the Bia Lam, um, that's College of Education, that's University of Health and Allied Sciences, National Accreditation Board of the UCC, Ministry of Education, Medina Institute of Science and Technology, SDA College of Education in Aguna, Tamale Technical University, St. Louis College of Education, University of Ghana, Legon, where we are hosted, Ashasi University, presented by Sir Mr. Patrick Wawang, University of Education, Winneba, Presbyterian College of Education, Ekropong, Ministry of Education, Reform Sector, University of Mines and Technology, Takwa, Al Farouk College of Education, University of Applied Management, Wa, po Wa Polytechnic, the Holy Child College of Education, University of Cape Coast, and GBWE in Kumasi. And I would have a lot more persons who are representing institutions also acknowledged as we go on in the program. But please, can we acknowledge them with a round of applause? Thank you very much. We will now have the opening remarks to set the tone for this all-important conversation. This is why yesterday I was having a conversation with this man, and most of often for us in the media, when such reforms or policies and introductions of new documents come up, the question we ask often is, has there been broad consultation? Because that is the first deduction any time something is introduced. And he said to me that, Alfred, if there is any word beyond broad, then I think it would describe the process that we have been on over the time for this particular reform. So on that note, we are on course. Ladies and gentlemen, I want us to welcome the Minister of State in charge of tertiary education, Professor Kwesi Yanka. Please put your hands together for him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister for Education, Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, Deputy Minister for Education, Mrs. Gifty Chumampofu, NCTE Executive Secretary, Executive Secretary for NAB, the National Accreditation Board, members of respective university and tertiary education councils here represented representatives of um, the several agencies of the Ministry of Education here, Vice Chancellor's Ghana, amply represented, and other representatives and officials in government and in the private sector, stakeholders. Let me add my voice to the words of welcome already extended to you by the moderator, and also to say that this forum is a very important one that has been long anticipated. Um, it adds to the several fora that have been organized by the ministry in connection with this particular document that is going to be outdoored. The document preparation started as far back as last year uh, with a committee chaired by Professor Tego, who had charged policy document that was all embracing and that took into consideration the pre-existing legislation and policies already in place and update these policies in the light of recent events. After the document was submitted to the ministry, the ministry did yet another stakeholder workshop. Remember, the document itself was written having consulted several stakeholders, including the vice chancellors of Ghana, administrators, and heads of public institutions and private institutions. 
Then the document was subjected to a workshop forum by the same stakeholders. It was after the workshop forum that the write-up was again revisited and then submitted to the minister who in turn submitted this to cabinet for consideration. And this is yet another forum, post-document, post-approval forum, sort of. And uh, to talk about this and to set the ball rolling will be the Minister for Education himself, whom I invite to take over from me, uh, do part of the presentation to be followed up by a continuation of that presentation by the Executive Secretary of the NCT, the National Council for Tertiary Education. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Matthew Pogoprempe comes in. Thank you. Good morning, uh, invited guests. We would like to share with distinguished guests the trust of government policy on tertiary education. The Ministry of Education is ultimately responsible for ensuring that education is provided at all levels and that that education is relevant and in response to national goals and aspirations. Expanding access to quality education at all levels is one of our mandates to see to that. That means we have to initiate and formulate policy for approval by cabinet and His Excellency the President, initiate legislation in furtherance of those policies approved coordinate those policies and programs associated with the various legislations and approvals, provide a responsible budget to see to the implementations of those policies and programs, and at the same time, try as much as possible to monitor and evaluate and ensure that the policies have the relevant impact. As far back as 20th February 2017, just after we finished the transition, issues emanating from the transition had set itself or brought forth what government should do in tertiary education to make it more relevant for the 21st century. At a curtsy call, sometime in February 2017. This was discussed with the vice chancellors who were present. Some of the issues that had arisen from the transitional time and that was brought forth in those discussions actually included regularization or ensuring the speedy upgrade of Tamale and Cape Coast Polytechnics to technical universities amongst the four. That is half of the issue. What that retention can be used for is also decided between the agencies and the Ministry of Finance because it's public funds and they are subject to audit and accountability through the Auditor General and the Ministry. Actually, we talked about outsourcing of non core activities by the university, including halls of residence. Taking cognizance of the fact that most universities 
have adopted the policy of in, out, 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 <laughs> meaning probably 75% of the student population live outside the confines or the purview of the university. We felt that probably, probably we need to look at the core activities and non-core activities and what the university management should concentrate on. Interestingly, one of the last items or the last item we discussed is working towards one act for the universities. The foundation of this is that in this country called Ghana, in 2012, under His Excellency the President John Ifan Atabils, all the 38 colleges of education were brought under one act. Under His Excellency John Ramani Mahama, in 2016, all the technical or polytechnics and the technical universities were brought under one act. It does not obviate that university's mandate, but 98% or 95% of any university's law is the same as other. It's only probably the first five, six clauses that limit or outline the functions and the mandates of the council and the university that is different from each other. These, alongside other issues, were subsequently raised in a letter that I sent to the regulator, National Council for Tertiary Education, to expedite work on these issues. That was generally what we felt that we would do in tertiary education. Ours was not to tinker with the management of tertiary education, not at all. We also recognize that in this country, Ghana, there is no document called the tertiary education policy. There's not a single source document that you take and open and see the trust of government on tertiary education policy. That itself must be revised uh, periodically. Better governed or better countries have it, and there was a need to start something. This culminated in May 2018 when the Minister of State, after assumption of office, I gave him a copy of that letter and told him that by, by and large, that is a thing, this is the policy direction we have for tertiary education he should receive it as a marching orders and run with it. Because there we have a Minister of State that has risen to the Pro Vice Chancellor of a public university and has become the Vice Chancellor of a private university. So if there's anybody who could um, work with the professors and the dons and the universities, it's probably him. In May 2018, the Minister of State, in consultation with the National Council for Tertiary Education, commissioned an expert team with the following terms of reference. To produce a reference document pulling together the various isolated policies in use and institutional best practices that will position institutions to better, better discharge their mandate. Take cognizance of the national vision, the 1992 constitution, and existing legislative arrangements. Propose additional policies and guidelines considered essential to deal with emerging trends in the governance and effective running of tertiary institutions. Take cognizance of current policy, current policy and reform initiatives of government. The draft policy, as has been just said, by the Minister of State, Professor Yanka, has gone through the mill, culminating in the validation workshop, 10th January to 12th January, a three-day workshop, 
in Koforidia, chaired by Professor Yanka. The stakeholders included all the entities that were mentioned. Corp, Precorp, GRASA, GNUFS, UTAG, VCG, NAPTEX, NAB, NCT, CTAG, and all the, all the acronyms. This revised policy has been approved by Cabinet on May 9th, 2019. And Cabinet charged us to refine it and launch it. Before the refinements and the launching, there's a need to sensitize the major stakeholders and players in the tertiary education space to, to generally have a, a feel of where one is going. Interestingly, the expert committee was chaired by a former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Tehu. It included the executive secretary of NCT. It included the executive secretary. The, the executive secretary of NCT, I understand, is a professor in mechanical engineering. Professor Clifford Tego is my senior. He examined me in medicine, professor of medicine. Kisle Yako, who is also a UG star and in the economics department. Uh, what, which department? Psychology. Was also a member of the committee. Mr. John Darcy, Deputy Executive Secretary of NCT, Legal Practitioner, Professor Aite, Mr. Paul Lefa, Mr. The committee full of people from the university communities, both private and public. And one of the reasons why we are here is that post policy, where the post policy, where there are existing legislation, demands a revision of those legislations. Because the policy, before you can implement, needs to be translated into legislation. So there's a need for this policy to be translated into legislation. That is why at the validation workshop in Koforidia, a draft policy, a draft bill was not hidden. A draft bill was not hidden, was not dictated. A draft bill was given to all the stakeholders. Actually, a presentation of a draft was given to all the stakeholders to take, take it to their communities and give us suggestions on how to improve the draft bill. Actually, the first time it's been done in this country. So it was rather very unfortunate that government being so open from experts committee, validation, and a draft bill, we hear on radio, if it, was, if it was just criticism, that was part of the suggestions we needed. But outright insults. Policy approved, one of my marching orders is to do a sensitization and awareness workshop Interestingly, interestingly, most stakeholders brought suggestions on how to improve the bill. And there was absolutely no need for persons to take particular interest in insults. Right? We never expected, government never expected that from a tertiary education space. That an engagement, so frontal an engagement, can degenerate. We had to keep quiet because we still had to get policy through and deal with the issues. Ours is not to respond to everybody who comes up the airwaves. There are over 300 stations in Ghana, and if the ministry says they are going to every radio station uh, to report, uh, we can never do our work. 
Ours is to concentrate, concentrate on our work and chart the path. We just want to demonstrate that this is not something that has been just picked out of the pocket and thrown. We've looked at international best practices. And I have with me, Kwame, let me have it, let me see. I have with me example of 10 countries, very, very democratic, extremely democratic, some even more democratic than ours. 10 countries. That, when I did the research, I came. There are very many, actually, there are many more countries. But the 10 I, that was interesting that I came across that have one university. I've already said in Ghana, we have one act for 46 colleges of education, which are all tertiary. We have one act for 10 technical universities, which are all tertiary. But I looked at Norway, and they had one act for all their universities. I looked at South Africa, and they had one act for all their universities. I looked at Denmark, and they had one act for all their universities. I looked at Kenya, and they had one act. I actually recently met the chief director who started the Kenyan act. I wanted him to come and speak at this forum. They have one act. And that act in Kenya includes even both public and private universities. I checked Malaysia, and they had one act. I went to Singapore, and they had one act. I went to Finland, and they had one act. I went to Zimbabwe, and they had one act. I went to Sweden, and there are 10 countries that almost every month you see on the WhatsApp platform, Ghana education, go and learn from Finland. Ghana education, go and learn from Singapore. Now we go and learn, and we are tempted, and we are insulted. We have ample opportunity to contribute to legislation to make it better but not to stop legislation because it's impossible. I remember when the University of Ghana was passing this last legislation. I was in parliament as an opposition MP. And I held that legislation down for some time. Interesting. I held that legislation down for some time because I felt there was a clause in that legislation that would be used. Interesting, we had a debate on the floor that will be used to prevent private citizens or public from entering Lagos. I have a hunch. One clause. I argued and held and held. And one of my colleagues from the government side came said, Napo, I assure you that this will never happen. So I let go. A few months after the passage of the University of Ghana legislation, it happened. And I hear national security. Instead of jaw joining, on two occasions came to break down Ligon erecting a gate. But that antecedent had been set in the law. So I'm pleading to the committee here that it is not a fight, it is an invitation to make the law better. But as to countries that we want legislation means government is going to detain this. The president has assured all the vice chancellor that he was the attorney general that took criminal libel off the books. And he is not going to be the president that wants to come to the university and detain anything. Management, governance, and accountability has got nothing, actually nothing to do with, to do with academic freedom. All over the world, there are countries that have shown that have one university act that are freer than even ours. So if we are learning from them, we will learn the best practice from them, include what makes Ghana different, and we hope to get better legislation. We hear always international best practices. What is that? Is our intellectuals going outside, learning from what is happening elsewhere, and coming back to make sure that ours is better. That is exactly what we want to do. We have no interest, the government has no interest. And like I said, if anybody can point to a place that shows that this clause 
means that you are dictating. We will revise it. There's absolutely no need to fight. We are demonstrating good faith. But when it comes to issues like government, uh, some universities have 10 gov uh, board members. Some have 20. So we want a standardized thing for policy harmonization and things. We have said nothing wrong because even in the country, Ghana, we already have such legislation. That is not meant to say that we are going to emasculate the universities or shut the universities. It's not possible. Those that contributed to this where we are today are all from the university. They are all from the highest rank of management of the university. And I'm not sure, I'm not really, really sure if they put something down, they want to be the former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana who wants to ask to do something that will cripple the hands of the University of Ghana. But we live in reality. And the democratic governance and democratic accountability must be enshrined. That is the trust of government policy. Nothing to do with dictation, nothing to do with interference, and it's got nothing, absolutely nothing, but to tell the universities how to behave. On that note, I would like Professor Salifu to take us through and sensitize and make us aware about the tertiary education policy, the legislative and institutional reform implications of the policy, and possibly, if he can do that in 30 minutes, we would, we would, we would highlight certain things about the draft bill. But the draft university bill has received extensive stakeholder re response that we are, we are computing and compiling and making sure that it reflects sufficiently where good is the bill. But I'll give an example. All my university lecturers I've met, all my professors I've met, all the acts that I've met, council, external council or the supervising council of the university has more external members than internal members. Actually, interestingly, I got a response from the University of Ghana that said in writing that they want more internal members than external members or something to that effect. But I looked at their law, the University of Ghana's law that exists, that we passed in 20... 12, 20. I looked at the University of Ghana law that we passed, one of the last laws that we passed in 2010. And interestingly, it has more external members than internal members. But they wrote to me that they were more internal than external. But the law that exists was different. It had more external than internal. So that is not to say we, are, we have come to the university and dictated to the university what they are doing. And our life was absolutely food to share with us the trust of government policy approved by cabinet on May 9th for tertiary education. Thank you. I, I saw on the, on the <coughs> program that there's no question and answer. Certainly, I would open myself for a few questions uh, after the program. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Um, actually, the objective uh, of today's uh, <clears throat> forum is to hear more than talk you know, uh, to you. So there's definitely uh, a Q&A session that will uh, follow the presentation. So distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Minister has given us an indication of where uh, the path that we have traveled uh, up to this point. And I just wanted to uh, connect with his presentation by starting from the purpose of the forum today. And the purpose, as you might have uh, picked from his presentation, 
uh, is essentially twofold. Uh, the first objective is actually to provide the sensitization and awareness creation on the tertiary education policy document itself. So we will look at some uh, salient points arising out of the tertiary education policy documents. Then we will look also at the legislative and institutional reform implications arising from the approved tertiary education uh, policy document. So that's the first objective, sensitization and awareness creation on these two aspects. And then secondly, uh, we would want to take this opportunity to provide a certain rationale for the draft public universities bill. Uh, minister has uh, uh, you know, talked to some of the points that have come across uh, on this particular bill. Actually, at this stage of consideration of the bill, uh, it ought not to have been in the public domain. At this stage, uh, what we are looking for is inputs into the zero draft, if you like. The zero draft is what was circulated. We sought stakeholder input so that we can produce a document that we can call a working draft working draft, and it is the working draft that then will take through the process of consideration and approval. So we don't even have that working draft as we sit here today. The objective was to get the input on the zero draft uh, so that we can see how we incorporate the comments, and then based on the refined version, we have what we call the working draft uh, to carry that forward. Unfortunately, uh, the matter ended up in the media domain, and uh, you know, a lot has happened. A lot of water has passed under the bridge. And I think one of the key points that have been raised most often was that uh, it wasn't even understood exactly why we were doing that. So I would try and provide a certain uh, rationale for doing the bill itself. I think Minister has done that, but there are some provisions that people found a little problematic. Uh, we will pick one or two of those positions and try and explain what informed that. Um, the tertiary education policy document itself um, is a very bulky document. It's almost about a, what, 80 page document. So I cannot, uh, at a forum like this, you know, go from cover to cover to let you understand what is in there. Uh, I can only pick, as I said, highlights from that. And uh, the highlights will just uh, indicate in each one of the thematic areas that the policy has been approved. Uh, what the, I think I needed an earlier, no, okay. Okay, so, um, so I'll do only the highlights of uh, the aspects of the policy uh, so that we can understand what is in there. Uh, the minister has indicated what the, uh, the context in which this will be done. Uh, we have the antecedents, antecedents to the uh, policy, and he goes back to uh, February 2017 uh, when some of the initial ideas that goes into the policy uh, were discussed. And I, I, would, I would call the 10 or 11 point agenda, his uh, agenda of uh, agenda, uh, the, the minister's own manifesto for reform. Uh, this is what was communicated as he indicated to you. And uh, that provided the basis for the discourse leading up to the uh, adoption of the tertiary education policy. So this agenda was communicated to the NCTE with uh, a directive to initiate action on how uh, these reforms will be carried out. And as we engage in the exercise, 
uh, it became quite evident that in order to do it properly, what was required was a much more exhaustive and comprehensive approach to developing policy. Uh, so we could situate these 10 or so uh, points in the context of a comprehensive tertiary education policy. So it led to the formation of the committee by the Honorable Minister of State. The committee took about three or four months to work on it, and that went through stakeholder consultation. Uh, after that, we had a revision of the policy. Uh, we submitted it to cabinet, and cabinet gave us approval subject to further refinement. So here we are to share the details with you. As far as the policy itself is concerned, we have been told uh, by the Honorable Minister what in our very recent uh, experience, in the last decade or two, you'll notice that there's been quite a rapid explosion in the institutions that are providing uh, tertiary education. Uh, the growth has been quite sporadic and haphazard, and part of the reason is that if you look at the policy environment in which this has happened, we've, it's largely been driven by isolated policy and, uh, if you like, piecemeal interventions. Most of what has happened has not been guided by a certain overall bigger picture about what the evolving education system is supposed to look like. And it hasn't been difficult for us to come to the conclusion that in order to guide this process properly towards the vision of providing an education system that presents our country as a learning society and a knowledge-driven economy, we needed a much more comprehensive, coherent, and well-articulated holistic policy framework. Uh, this policy framework allows us to provide clear guidelines for what the ultimate structure of our tertiary education system must look like, and then it gives us the different dimensions of what needs to be done for that ultimate structure to be approved. And that involves the planning aspects, development, regulation, operations, and overall governance and accountability of the system as a whole. All of this in one document where you see the different pieces, but you also see what the interconnections are uh, to give it that holistic character. So the document itself, as I said, is a very big one, almost about uh, 80 pages. Uh, in terms of structure, uh, it is presented in five broad areas. And these areas include governance and management. Uh, under governance and management, we have institutional level governance. Uh, we also have external governance, which is where the institute, uh, the uh, ministry interfaces with the uh, institution. Uh, we have aspects dealing with appointments and designations of uh, principal officers, academic freedom. That's our pet subject. I'm sure it will come up uh, subsequently in the discussions here. And then there's an aspect on accountability of tertiary education institutions. There's another main chapter on equity and access. And this has to draw from constitutional imperatives. Our constitution actually devotes a lot of um, attention to the need for access and equity. Uh, aspects of that relate to expansion and establishment of tertiary education institutions, the provision of flexible and distributed learning, diversification and differentiation. Ultimately, that's the policy that would determine the structure of our tertiary education system. And then the third chapter is on quality and relevance. 
very, very important aspects, and you will find that uh, the sub-themes under this is very long, all the way from uh, entry requirements into our tertiary institutions through academic progression, postgraduate training to uh, the physical structures uh, that must be in place uh, to guarantee uh, provision of the tertiary education to the standard that is required. Then we have finance and then uh, cross-cutting issues. Uh, these are issues on inclusivity, uh, gender, sexual harassment. We also have HIV, ICT. So that is the structure of the policy and um, the sub-themes that are captured under that. As I said, I'll just pick a few of the items in it so that you can appreciate what is there. So on policies, uh, on governance and management, uh, the first sub-item is on coordination of the tertiary education system. There has to be an overall in charge that looks at the entire landscape like the uh, conductor of an orchestra uh, to ensure that everybody is in place, they are playing to the right tune, they are standing at the right place, and then contributing to the harmonious tune that the uh, orchestra is supposed to generate. Coordination and oversight, very important. The policy statement, uh, number one, the Ministry of Education shall have general policy formulation and monitoring functions over the system. That is at the overall level. And the regulator, there shall be an apex regulatory body whose responsibility shall include general supervision and direction for all tertiary education institutions. That is at the external uh, governance uh, level. In terms of institutional level governance, it's important to state that the structure of governance within the institution recognizes what is called the bicameral system. And the recognition arises from the understanding that as far as the broad strategic issues are concerned, you will need a council that will take the strategic policy-related decisions, but internally there are structures that are so provided to ensure that every segment of the university community contributes effectively to eventually the strategic decisions that are made at council. Uh, so in order to ensure effectiveness of this institution level, uh, gov institutional level governance, there are policy statements that uh, have been uh, listed. The Ministry of Education shall ensure that the acts of governing public universities are harmonized to ensure consistency and enhance operational effectiveness and efficiency. If these are public institutions of the same generic type, providing a certain service with similar expectations, you want to make sure that their structure and operations are consistent uh, they provide a certain level of predictability and makes it easy for the governance and the control mechanisms to work. The second one is government working through the regulator uh, to set out desirable qualifications for members of council. And because we tend to have a stakeholder council, these desirable qualifications need to be shared with these constituent uh, uh, bodies so that in nominating their representatives, they will be guided by that. Membership of the councils and boards of public tertiary institutions shall not be less than nine number, but not more than 13. And the rationale, you will see that this is quite a significant departure from what our recent legis legislation has provided. The rationale here is to have a compact board that is agile in decision making and that leverages the advantages of this bicameral system I was talking about. Essentially, you are seeking to have a much more lay board where you have more external members on the council focusing on the strategic decision uh, making. Even though the numbers of the core board members is being limited to between 9 and 13, the councils themselves will be uh, mandated 
and there's a, a policy statement to that effect, that the council shall have the power to co-opt additional members from outside the institution by such co-opted members, uh, once so down will be non-voting uh, in status. Which means that if you have a certain issue that you need to discuss and you need expertise from outside the council, uh, you can do that and expand the membership accordingly. And then the provision also is that we should have at least two thirds of the members of council being external members. So we don't have uh, we don't want more than a third to be coming from within, and that is staff and students. This is what the essence of the lay board is. Appointments and designations, appointments and designations of principal officers. Uh, we've had quite some diversity in how this is handled. Some of it errors in the legislation, some also institutional practices that have influenced that. So the concept has become a little confused when it should be quite apparent. Uh, principal officers are officers who by designation and in their capacity can commit the university. And the policy says, this designation of principal officers shall apply only to the chancellor, the pro-chancellor or the council chairman and the vice chancellor, period. That is the list of principal officers. Everybody else will come by their names and designations, but they will be some other uh, officers, not principal officers. The vice chancellor and other officers in the institution, and I underline in the institution because this is something that is used in the clause that we are referring to shall be appointed by the governing council in accordance with Article 1953 of the 1992 Constitution. The chancellor shall be appointed by the president following a recommendation made by the council, and only chartered universities shall have chancellors. We have university colleges and all shapes and sizes of uh, tertiary institutions that purport uh, to uh, have chancellors, and uh, that is actually contrary to what uh, the practice must be. Policies on academic culture, uh, use of academic titles. This is another area that has been abused. And uh, my colleague at NAB has had several occasions, and uh, I believe a Minister of State, to speak about it. We are making policy statements to reflect that. Tertiary institutions shall enact statutes on the award and conditions of use of, for academic titles, including honorary degrees. Appointment of emeritus or emerita professor must be based on merit, must be based on statutes, and granted only by the university from which the person retired as a full professor. And once again, only chartered institutions or universities may award honorary degrees or appoint emeritus professors. Academic fraud is a global phenomenon we know, but it's getting uh, quite prevalent in our country here. And the danger is that you get people presenting themselves for what they are not worth and they end up uh, in employment and all kinds of uh, places. It undermines the credibility of the system and trust, you know, in the system as a whole. Policy statement, all forms of academic fraud are criminal and must be handled by the appropriate agencies. No university or tertiary education institution must purport to be dealing with issues relating to academic fraud. It is fraud and it's criminal and the authorities, appropriate agencies must deal with it when uh, you come across that. Employers also have the primary responsibility to confirm credentials presented to them from people who are seeking employment. Accountability of tertiary education system. Naturally, public tertiary education institutions are set up by law to provide quality education in specific mandated areas and are guided by delivery standards. These have to be provided exactly as mandated. 
So the regulatory body shall have adequate mechanisms in place to demand accountability from tertiary education institutions, which institutions shall abide by these uh, mechanisms. Tertiary education institutions shall be subject to quality assurance and accreditation at both institutional and program levels. The regulatory body shall establish a mechanism for ranking of institutions by type and programs. We need to be able to know in time uh, how we stand in relation to others who are providing a similar service. And that is good for the institution because it's motivation, but it's also good for the prospective student who is seeking uh, to do a program in the universities. And whether we like it or not, in this uh, global uh, village that we live in, you will be ranked whether you like it or not. You don't have to subscribe to be ranked. <laughs> you will be ranked whether you like it or not. So the earlier we prepared ourselves, dealt with the issues that are required for ranking, the better for us. And then the regulatory body shall publish the recognition status of tertiary education institutions as pre prescribed by law. Policies on equity and access. Uh, this is partly a constitutional injunction. So while the establishment of new institutions, uh, the sub-item is on expansion and establishment. Uh, while the establishment of new institutions have been by government in response to the constitutional imperatives and expansion, uh, the constitutional government has actually taken charge. Government leads the process of expansion of existing institutions, uh, but uh, the creation, the expansion of existing institutions have largely been driven internally by the institutions uh, themselves. Normally with little or no reference to the ministry or the regulatory agency, and there are consequences arising out of that. Uh, the implications are that it affects the broad structure of the system it may distort the diversification and differentiation that we talk about. It drives cost, and a lot of the time it leads to what we call mission creep. The institution is set up to do A, and by those gradual modifications and expansion, different programs, sooner or later you can't identify it for uh, the purpose that it was set up for. This has to be checked. So government acting through the regulator shall ensure that the expansion of existing and creation of new institutions shall be guided by the policy on differentiation and diversification. Uh, by the way, the idea of differentiation and diversification uh, is to actually reflect on the structure of the tertiary education system in a way that it responds to the diverse needs of the labor market out there. So, we need to set up the system in such a way that all the different options that the labor market would require, there are institutions to provide that. And within every generic category of institutions, like universities, uh, UHAS must be sufficiently differentiated from uh, UCC, uh, so that even within that generic category, we provide still further options. And that is what will guide the structure of our system. All public tertiary institutions shall develop 10-year strategic plans which shall be endorsed by the regulator and provide a framework and plans for future growth. If this happens, then this is a plan that is logged with the regulator and on a day-to-day -day basis take decisions. The decisions can be referenced to that so that all of us can assure ourselves that you are gradually and incrementally building capacity and deepening your uh, uh, control of the mandated area. Uh, public tertiary institutions shall operate within their mandated focus area prescribed in their enabling acts. Expansion of existing institutions through the establishment of branch campuses shall be based on careful assessment of capacities to effectively manage without compromising quality, and this has to be agreed with the regulator. Government shall promote technology-driven options to ensure equitable access to quality education, including the active promotion of open and distance learning. 
participation, uh, private participation in tertiary education. Now, while the role of the private sector is considered key, uh, there have been complaints about proliferation and poor quality uh, standards in some of our institutions. Uh, in the future, as the demand grows, naturally we are going to need more private sector provision, but there has to be policies to regulate that. So government shall provide an enabling environment to attract and sustain private sector provision of tertiary education through the policies and incentives. Private tertiary education institutions, including cross-border services, shall be established in accordance with appropriate legal and regulatory requirements. And the regulatory body shall institutionalize monitoring and evaluation to make sure that everybody stays on track. On admissions, and this is still on access and equity, our 1992 constitution enjoins the state to provide equal access to university or equivalent level education with emphasis on science and technology. And uh, you are aware that the NCTE publishes minimum entry requirements, usually based on WASI results uh, for candidates that are seeking to enter our tertiary system. Currently, these admissions are decentralized, but they are not always driven by some of the constitutional imperatives in terms of access, equity, inclusion, and all that. So the policy statements seek to address this. All students seeking admission to tertiary education institutions must meet minimum entry requirements. Under no circumstance should somebody be admitted to tertiary education institutions when they haven't met the entry requirements approved by the regulator. Qualified candidates shall, as much as possible, be placed on merit, except under special circumstances when addressing equity and inclusion concerns. And this is the big one. There shall be a centralized applications and placement service for public universities. Private tertiary institutions shall be encouraged to enlist on this service. And as Minister underscored here, it is an applications platform. That's all that it is. But it's sanitizing the diversity of uh, approaches that we have used uh, in the past until now and uh, it also makes the application process much, much easier for prospective applicants. Uh, it provides a repository for you know, data, very important data on attributes of applicants, matriculation, numbers, preferences of programs that we can immediately access live to inform uh, a policy going forward. So it's a very important platform, and uh, as he did indicate, uh, the next academic year, obviously, the uh, admissions are virtually underway, but uh, there has been work on this, and I'll touch on that briefly as we go on. Lastly, admissions of different categories of students shall be guided by quotas. We have had uh, fee-paying students, uh, we've had foreign students, we've had all minor of, you know, categories of students are being admitted. We need to look at it relative to the constitutional imperatives and set quotas. Fortunately, if we have a platform that we are like uh, the one we are designing, these quotas can be embedded into the decisions that the universities make. The universities still will be in charge of the decision making on admissions. Nobody is going to take that away from them. Policies on quality and relevance. The development of new programs must have relevant industry stakeholder input and support. That's the first policy statement. All new formal degree programs proposed to be delivered at a public tertiary institution must be subject to relevance, clearance, and accreditation by the regulator. No programs shall be started unless they have been duly approved and accredited. And tertiary education institutions, in developing their programs, must be mindful of their mandated areas, and they must emphasize that. Your program portfolio and your enrollment must reflect your mandate. That is what distinguishes you from other institutions. Academic progression and graduation. Uh, students enrolling in tertiary education obviously expect to make progress during their different stages of study, 
and to complete on time with prior agreed competencies and outcomes. These are the expectations that our students have. And the policy environment must be such that we guarantee that. Tertiary education institutions shall have appropriate information management systems to capture progression and attrition rates for each course, program, and institution as a whole, and report same annually to the regulator. Number two, the regulator shall design and implement a tertiary education management information system for easy and reliable retrieval and analysis of data to inform policy. And thirdly, tertiary education institutions shall conduct tracer studies of their graduates every three years and shall report same to the regulator. Tracer studies will have to become a mandatory part of the record, uh, reporting requirement so that as an institution, when you produce the graduates, you keep in touch with them, you know how they are faring in industry and how their performance is feeding back into new programs that you are running. Research and postgraduate studies. Uh, this is an area that we haven't done well, uh, you know, as far as our university system is concerned. Uh, but incidentally, that is what distinguishes a university from a real university. Research and innovation, the training of postgraduates. This is what distinguishes a university from a real university. It is through these activities that new knowledge is generated and high level manpower produced. Unfortunately, we lag behind. All the countries that you see there, we lag behind them. South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, in areas of research and publication and postgraduate training. We need to do something about that. The policy requires that governments will be committed to increasing funding for research from the present 0.3% of GDP to at least the AU minimum benchmark of 1%. Government shall establish a national research and innovation fund to address priority areas of research and development in support of national uh, economic growth and poverty reduction. Thirdly, government shall facilitate the setting up of centers of excellence in selected universities and disciplines, particularly in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And the regulator shall identify and designate research intensive universities for special support. We can, it cannot be that all of us will be active and relevant as far as research uh, and postgraduate training is concerned. We will need to identify institutions that have the biggest potential to support them so they can make the best impact. This is targeted support. Now, teacher education. Academic attainment of students, as we all know, depends very largely on the extent of uh, what, the competence of the teacher. Uh, the teacher, on the other hand, also needs to be prepared so that they can be more competent and inspiring uh, in the classroom. The policy statements. The ministry shall ensure that colleges of education and other tertiary teacher education institutions provide relevant, high quality teaching and learning. Number two, the ministry shall ensure that the curriculum reforms in teacher education are coherent and they address the national teaching standard and the education curriculum, uh, teacher education curriculum framework. Uh, and this is a big one. Tertiary education institutions shall ensure that all academic staff go through teacher education programs to prepare them to teach. It is not enough to have a PhD in zoology. You need to have the competence to impart the knowledge that you have gained in zoology to the students that you are teaching. And you can only do that when you have been trained in the uh, techniques and know how to teach. So new appointees shall have graduate certificates in teaching. Before you are employed as a lecturer, you need to go through a formal training program to be so uh, acknowledged as somebody who is capable of teaching. 
uh, of course, the implication of the policy is that those who are already in the system, and I know most of the investors are doing that anyway, uh, you organize summer programs, all kinds of continuing professional development programs to equip them with the skills to teach. This is an opportunity for UCC and uh, UEW. Uh, can you imagine rolling out uh, postgraduate certificates uh, in how to teach in universities for all the university uh, lecturers uh, who don't have this background. Then the last but, uh, bit is uh, colleges of education shall be integrated into selected universities as university colleges. I want to talk about tertiary level TVET. This is also a very important thing. I believe my friends from the technical universities are here. It's a very, very important part of the reform agenda. Uh, we know that currently the TVET instruction takes place largely in our two politics, uh, polytechnics and eight uh, converted uh, technical universities. Uh, the potential for this impacting on our economy is huge, and we rely, we want to rely a lot on what these institutions deliver. Policy statements. Technical universities shall be the apex institutions in TVET for the training of highly skilled human resource to drive economic growth. Number two, technical universities shall operate and be regulated as specialized universities with niche mandates. And I want to repeat that. They shall operate and be regulated as specialized universities with niche mandates. Uh, the fact that you are in the TVET domain does not make you a vocational institution. You are first and foremost a university, and then secondly, a university that is primed to deliver a certain type of education. We want to emphasize that. Uh, technical universities, while achieving parity of esteem with the universities, shall not depart from the practice-oriented philosophy of TVET. I know there are a lot of tensions, you know, because we are in some kind of transition towards the eventual setup that we want you to be at. Uh, and all kinds of, uh, uh, what, uh, tensions are leading to this, right? We will keep the focus and make sure that ultimately, when we agree that your conversion is finally completed, you will be set up in a way as to deliver within the TV domain. We don't intend to create you as replicas of the traditional universities. We need to acknowledge that. Uh, technical universities shall create progression pathways at tertiary level for practically inclined SHS and technical school graduates. And you shall develop strong links with industry. And this is a new one, part of the reform. There shall be a university that is specialized in the training of teachers for all levels of TVET. In fact, uh, I don't know if the Honorable Minister uh, would allow me to say that. Already there's a proposal to bring together about eight or 10 or so of the colleges of education that are in areas that are in TVET. Uh, to bring them up together with, uh, Chairman, I'm sorry to say that, that's UEW Council Chairman, we are going to take away the Kumasi campus of UEW, the Mampong campus of UEW, and then together with the Colleges of Education, set up the nucleus for this specialized university that uh, uh, the policy advocates. Policies on financing. Uh, VCG, I'm sure, would be looking forward to this, like everybody else. Uh, a sustainable funding policy framework shall be put in place to include the cost sharing, uh, students' loans trust, Ghana Education Trust Fund, and Ghana Government Scholarship Scheme for Priority Disciplines. This is the, uh, what, the complex of uh, measures, interventions that will provide a framework for financing. So this is the first point. The second point is that cost of tertiary education shall be shared between government tertiary education institutions, students, and the private sector. This is a long-standing stakeholder agreement on how we should finance tertiary education going forward, and it's being captured in the policy. Government budgetary allocation to tertiary education shall be at least 2.5% of GDP. It's a policy aspiration. 
at least 50% of the GET Fund budget allocation shall be disbursed to tertiary education. Tuition shall be free for all Ghanaian students except those who opt for fee-paying category. Ghanaian students shall pay academic facility user fees. And for those in halls of residence, you will pay residential facility user fees and, of course, the cost of utilities that you consume. These are user costs that you will need to uh, take care of. Non-Ghanaian students, naturally, shall pay the full cost of their education. And all tertiary education institutions shall be required to generate at least 30% of their budget requirement from internal sources. So this is actually the, if you like, um, a best eye view of what is entailed in the tertiary education policy. Uh, if there are other dimensions you think are missing, uh, we can take that up in the question and answer session. So naturally, the policy will transform into a number of reform initiatives. And I just decided to list them uh, for your information. So the draft bill on the Public Universities uh, uh, Act is, is on. The Centralized Applications and Placement Service, uh, Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. Uh, there is um, a measure of uh, NAB and NCTE uh, to provide more effective regulation for the sector, and that will be called the Tertiary Education Commission. Uh, National Research and Innovation Fund, Minister alluded to that. Uh, tertiary Education Management Information Systems will be set up for effective coordination and uh, supervision. UDS is a policy, uh, 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 what, uh, statement. It's a policy intervention. Government is actually uh, splitting up UDS into three independent universities. So the WA campus becomes the University of Business and Integrated Development Studies, and then the Navarogo campus will become University of Technology and Applied Sciences. Uh, University of Media, Arts, and Communication. Uh, this will be the university coming out of uh, Ghana Institute of Languages, uh, NAFTI, and then Ghana Institute of uh, Journalism. Uh, colleges of Education being converted into university colleges. We have already communicated that to the universities uh, concerned. All the colleges have been assigned to the universities. There's an affiliation uh, arrangement, a collaboration framework that we have provided for them to confer and help us uh, guide the process. There will be a certain transition between now and the next two to three years where the colleges will effectively become part of the universities. Then the specialized university I talked about that will focus on training teachers for the TVET sector is the National University of Skills and Entrepreneurial Development. Uh, we would also uh, be taking steps. Actually, we have already gone quite far in doing that, in establishing an open university in Ghana where we can leverage technology to significantly increase the uh, supply of uh, tertiary education. Outsourcing of halls of residence. As part of the policy on the university divesting itself from non-core activities, the policy is for uh, the university to consider outsourcing halls of residence so they can be managed. Mentioned the postgraduate certificate in teaching for university lecturers. I think UEW and uh, UCC owe me a consultancy fee for this. Uh, this is a very important opportunity. So that's the reform. Now, uh, the just highlights of what uh, issues have come around in relation to the draft public uh, universities bill. Uh, as you would know, apart from the eight technical universities converted from polytechnics under the Technical Universities Act, as amended by Act 947, there are 10 traditional public universities in Ghana. Uh, these 10 are currently mandated by different acts. KNUST uh, under PNDC Law 240, amended Act 559 of 1998. Uh, UCC UDS have 
PNDC uh, what routes. As we sit here today, if you wanted to constitute their councils, you will need to find somebody to nominate a representative of the committees for the defense of the revolution. <laughs> because it, it, it is uh, P, under PNDC law, uh, 278 and 279. UPSA uh, 2012 Act 850, GIMPA, UMAT, and uh, UEW uh, from 2004, University of Ghana 2010, UHAS and UENR are uh, probably the most recent no, UESD actually is the latest. I have missed that one out. Uh, UMAT and UENR 2011. Now, the reason we are seeking to do what we are doing is that many of these acts, as you will see, are long overdue for review. The context in which the laws were passed, as I said, you know, when the revolution was taking place, has changed. We have since moved on uh, with our constitution into uh, a republic. And some of those things predate the Fourth Republic, and so they are overdue. There are key provisions in the various laws that vary widely. In fact, sometimes they even appear to contradict from one university to the other, and these need to be reconciled. There are new policies and reforms in tertiary education that have to find expression in the enabling laws of these institutions. And that has to be accommodated. There's a need also to ensure a more effective regulatory oversight and accountability, and that means that provisions in the laws, particularly in relation to uh, appointment of chancellor and council, term of office of council, functions of council, uh, that likely impact on mission of the university or carry contingent financial uh, liabilities. All these things need to be addressed. So apart from the acts being dated, there are very substantial material things that need to change. Uh, council membership structure to reflect the lay board that we talked about and emphasize the bicameral system, need to harmonize provisions to ensure consistency and predictability in governance across the public uh, universities. And then it gives us the opportunity also to insert clauses. Uh, we have had in our recent history a number of challenges in how universities are governed uh, through their councils. And some of these experiences need to reflect uh, in the uh, changes going forward. Obviously, it's one of two options. Either you pick the individual acts one by one and go through the laborious process of consideration from all the stages to parliament and have them approved, or you do what we are doing. In fact, there are two variants of doing the individual acts. The first one is carry out limited amendments of the individual acts and bring them in line with, bring them in line with the new policies and reforms. Sorry. Where am I? OK. OK, this is actually where I am now. Yeah, so the first one is to carry out limited amendments of the individual acts and bring them in line with some new policies and reforms, but preserve the so-called autonomous structure and functions of councils. That's one option. The second option will be to amend the individual act. It's a variant of looking at the individual acts and bring them in line with the new policies and reforms and to provide for more effective regulatory oversight and accountability. The second option would have been more comprehensive in trying to deal with the issues that the combined bill would deal with. Okay, the first one would be retaining certain provisions in the individual acts which people feel emotionally attached to. Either way, if you know the process by which a bill eventually gets passed into law, you will appreciate that this will be a counterproductive effort. It will uh, be an extremely laborious effort, time wasting, and at the end of the day, you may not be able to achieve the objectives that you set out to. But it gives, it would have given some comfort for those who are uh, saying that one act is making the universities look the same. I believe the minister's examples have actually demonstrated that. Uh, by no means. The one act for all universities. In fact, in many jurisdictions, you have what is called a higher education act. 
It's not just the universities. It is the regulatory bodies within the sector who are also captured under that one act. And it doesn't make them the same. Each individual university has its own mandate, and they operate as such. Uh, we had Polytechnics Act. Uh, it didn't make Tamale Poly the same as Accra Poly. Uh, we've had Technical Universities Act. Each technical university has a mandated area. In fact, in Uganda and uh, Kenya and all that, they have this uh, similar act. But you hear more about Makerere than some other university. By no means does this thing make you look the same. But at least it would have addressed that point. And uh, there's also the perception that it's a one-size-fits-all. And so if we we're dealing with them individually, then uh, perceptively, at least you'll be dealing with them uh, separately. These options were considered and going forward based on the best practices and the effort that would have been required to get this thing done, it wasn't going to be a viable option. So it leaves us with the option of promoting a common public universities act that will incorporate the provisions reflecting new policies and reforms and the requirements for more effective regulatory oversight and accountability. Why do we do it? The implications arising from this is that the, this option makes it possible for us to repeal and replace either specific sections of all the entire acts to bring them in line with the expectations. It gives us the opportunity to focus on the broad overarching issues, opportunity to harmonize administrative procedures and infuse predictability Approach is also straightforward. Uh, it reinforces the shared status and attributes of universities as public. You know, once you are put on that one law, uh, obviously your mandated areas will be specified, will be locked into the law, and so you will not look like the other person, but at least you know that you have a shared parenting. All of you are public universities, and that recognition will be more than clear. And um, as I said, the same approach has been used for the others. Why do I keep speaking? Okay. So, okay. So this is this is the option I've just spoken of. So I'll just briefly go through some of those areas that uh, we've had some. Uh, let me emphasize again that uh, Honourable Minister uh, reiterate what he said. We have had feedback from a significant, you know, uh, number of institutions. And the idea is to sit down and look at all those uh, comments relative to the zero draft, see how we can incorporate that. So this is very much work in progress. Uh, what I'm going to provide here is not necessarily justification, but to give you a sense of what the rationale, the thinking behind some of the provisions that we put in there. So uh, the first point was on the appointment of uh, the chancellor. Uh, we've had concerns that if you appoint a chancellor, then you are controlling everybody. Uh, but I keep wondering, I mean, when you form a business, uh, <laughs> you take control of the board and you decide how the board decisions are, are done, isn't it? If you are a public institution, government has naturally has to have the uh, de determining say in what, what you do. This shouldn't be a problem. Appointment of chancellor, the existing situation is that uh, especially the post-PNDC laws, I've listed them, they empower the councils to appoint the chancellor. The PNDC laws actually empower the president himself uh, to do that. The exception is University of Ghana. University of Ghana actually has an electoral college uh, in their law consisting of council and academic board that elect uh, a chancellor. Uh, we have proposed, the proposed is to provide for appointment of chancellor by the president of the republic in consultation with the councils. So the councils will do the due diligence and present uh, uh, what recommendation to the president for appointment. The reason for this is clarity in accountability to the appointing authority, and it resolves the anomaly and contradiction of council appointing a person who then takes precedence over it. If you look at the current enactment, the council is the one that appoints the chancellor, and once the chancellor is appointed, then he takes precedence over the council going forward. Okay. It looks like 
you know, a situation where you have the mandate to appoint your boss. And so when there's a problem, in terms of resolving the conflicts becomes a problem. It reinforces government's uh, role as a business owner. And from all the institutions, the countries that have the same historical antecedents that we have in Africa and elsewhere, this is what the practice has uh, been. Appointment of the governing council. Uh, most provisions provide for the president to do that in accordance with Article 70. So we would uh, keep that. The proposal is to confirm that provision. Uh, and further to this, additional provision uh, for the minister or the president to exercise his appointing authority, uh, you know, in exercise of the appointing authority to intervene, to put in place interim arrangements, if necessary, in situations of crisis and emergency where the position of counselor, uh, counsel becomes untenable. And this is not a strange clause. Actually, if you look at the Higher Education Act, South Africa, and by the way, we know that when the university rankings are released, the top 20 African higher education institutions, more than two thirds of them come from South Africa. So it couldn't be that this arrangement would impact negatively on how uh, your work is done. The, it has extensive clauses on intervention of the minister. And these interventions include coming in when there's a crisis situation. In fact, the minister is mandated actually to enact standard statutes for the universities. And if you like, as a public tertiary institution in South Africa, you can pick what the minister has enacted as statutes and work with it, or you are liberty to uh, add whatever you need to add to it, but that has to come back to parliament for approval. This is a similar process that we went through with the technical universities. It's being done as best practice elsewhere. Composition and number of members of the governing council. In most of these acts, we have 17, up to 17, the more recent act, out of which nine members are from within the university community. University of Ghana has an extra provision for appointment of six others from outside the university. I think the total number is about 21 or something. It's similar to what happens in Makarere or uh, uh, Ibadan. The proposal is to limit this number because the experience is that it's been a cost center, you know, problematic cost center. Uh, the limitation makes the uh, council much more compact and agile in decision making. And it reinforces this point about the uh, uh, lay board that we talked about. And in line with corporate best practice, the majority of council members must come from outside. Term of office of the council. Uh, that, there's a screen here. I can't see the screen. I wonder what... That is for you. Okay. So you need to know where I am now. Term of office of council. Okay, we haven't done the number, oh, number and composition that has been done. Term of office. Okay, so this varies between the legislation in, in, in the different acts that we have, between two and three years for members. Uh, and the vice chancellor is ex official member. Uh, three years appears common in the more recent acts, and if you look at the global best practice, this is about the minimum. Uh, there are universities that have the two-year limit, and I just wonder how the council gets to do its business, because when you are appointed, it takes you time to get to know the nature of the business. By the time you get a handle on it, that's the time you have to renew your mandate, and that's the situation we face with UMAT and some other institutions going forward. So the idea is to harmonize this uh, provision and stipulate that three years at least. Two years obviously is impractical and the councils barely have enough time uh, to do that. Uh, it would also be consistent with recent uh, legislations. Uh, provisions for accountability. There are various elements that cut across the entire bit. And these are meant to actually look at the context in which decision making takes place and what the implications are. So in all the existing acts, you have unfettered powers to the council to take decisions as necessary for the university's well-being and meeting its objectives. There's no problem, it's not in contention. 
but there are certain decisions that have wide implications outside the boundaries of the university. Uh, some of the decisions that are currently being made relate to enactment of statutes, internal organization, creation of new colleges, schools, and all that. Uh, incidentally, when the council has to take decisions that are academic in nature, the council is, it make, uh, the laws make it mandatory. The council is obliged to consult academic board. There's no way council can take a decision on academic related matters without passing it through the academic board. In fact, uh, based on my experience in KNUSC, there have been at least two seminar moments where council took decisions and they had to come back to academic board for that to be looked at. Strangely, decisions that have contingent financial liability that would eventually get back to government do not require the councils to even make any consultation whatsoever. So the decision is taken. It has some, uh, uh, it runs into some uh, bad weather. Uh, there are huge millions and millions of dollars that the university has to pay. The university quickly uh, recognizes that it has a, a business owner and it runs to the business owner to bail them out. What we are saying is that there has to be some engagement on decisions like this, so that when the situation arises, all parties are aware of it already. The other part is that if the council takes these decisions on the expansion, creation of colleges and all that, and nobody is consulted, sooner or later, the university is doing other things other than what it was set up to do. So these are accountability clauses that we put in there to ensure that there's some consultation. Nobody wants to take decision making away from the council. But decision making has to be done in a manner that is uh, appropriate. Alignment with uh, new policy arrangements. Uh, so there are new things that have come up, like the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission and its, uh, what it does relative to the council. There has to be commensurate provisions in the regulator's bill and in the uh, act of the uh, uh, enabling act of the institution to ensure that that relationship works out well. And then we've talked about the curves. Naturally, it has to find reflection. That's how it comes in there. Uh, a lot has been talked, uh, said about the curves already. We can come back to that in the Q&A session. So uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, we set out to sensitize and create awareness. I believe that uh, at least what we have said has triggered some uh, thoughts. Uh, I hope we have money to sensitize, sensitize you enough uh, but if there are any questions, please. Uh, Honorable Minister is here. Honorable Minister of State is also here. They will help me address those questions going forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Professor Salafu. So this, I mean, it's an 80-page document. There's no way we can run through everything. But... Um, you know, policies don't, don't work by themselves, and uh, it certainly has to have the, the backing and the buy-in of uh, stakeholders uh, supposed to implement or execute the details of this particular document. So thank you. Now, the questions, and as a Q&A session, I would invite the minister uh, in charge of education, uh, Dr. Matthew Pocoprempe, to please take a seat, and then also the minister of state in charge of tertiary education, Professor Yanka, to also take a seat, please. Thank you very much. Um, if you have a question, there are three microphones positioned in the middle and the two ends of uh, the hall. You can kindly walk up to it, put up your hand, line up very decently so we can uh, go straight to the point and ask our questions. Let me just remind you that this is the special forum on tertiary education reforms and the reforms, proposed reforms, is what you, you, you've seen right there um, as presented by Professor Mohamed Salifu. We're live on TV3, GTV, Star FM 103.5, and Adom TV and Home Base TV as well. So you mentioned your name, the institution that you are representing, then you go ahead with the question. I'll just take a quick one because I am here. I always take the advantage of asking the first question. It's interesting that, Mr. Minister, 
refers to what happened in, in Kenya because the Kenya National Higher Education bothers a lot more on equity. It's actually the Kenya National Higher Education Policy on Equity. So I want to find out how you are going to ensure equity because it is mentioned under the quality and relevance aspect of the reforms we just, we just saw. You are going to have the university still maintain the minimum entry requirement, but then there'll be special circumstances addressing equity and inclusion concerns. What are those special circumstances, first of all? And how are you going to ensure that this does not also bother on issues of autonomy of the, of the universities, and the quality of the graduates that come through it? The next question, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Bashiru Ayai Said, a professor in Mathematics and Statistics Department of Kumasi Technical University. Um, I'm very happy as far as this particular forum is concerned, but it has to do with two parties, the government and then the institution. Here we are talking about accountability and transparency. Let me consider the technical university situation. I want to make, respectfully, I want to make a correction on uh, this. And the act, the amended act is nine, Act 974 instead of 947, a quick one. I'm just. Uh, okay. To. Now, if you look at the transitional provisions of the technical universities, there are seven of them. The only one the technical universities were waiting for was when it was amended that for you to become a university staff, you are to be subjected to two things. One, the scheme of service, and then two, the standardized statute, which has been done since October. So for me, the transitional provision so once we have gone through that, we are in June. The government now has said to that the institutions, we have done our part in submitting ourselves through all these exercises. Now, for you to be recognized as a university staff, you have to also be remunerated accordingly. This okay. So the, the, what, what exactly is the point? Please, so the point is that when we are all talking about accountability and transparency, I believe that it should be, it should cut across. So if the institution does its part, the government should also do its part. So that is the issue the technical universities have, okay. as, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. All right, much. thank you very much. Um, next question, please. You can walk up to the microphone and ask the question. Well, oh, yes, please, sorry. For, I, I see about four people. If you can move to, in fact, diversify your All presence. Right. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Gladys Jansi. I'm from the Department of Adult Health School of Nursing, University of Ghana. Um, I must congratulate the team for what has been done so far. I have concerns with the cap, but it seems it's a policy and so you are bound to let it happen. Uh, my concern is how this is going to work because I know as an acting head of department that the, the fees that are paid in the admission process are part of our IGF. So if you take it off, how are you going to replace it? We want some understanding about that. Okay. And then the, my major issue is Aye. increasingly as a trainer of nurses and midwives, we are faced with the challenge of our students having to pay for service fees to assess the clinical uh, facilities. It's becoming an issue. Just yesterday, we had to go and negotiate and beg one of the institutions to waive it off. Okay. Where is the place of the integration of service learning right. in uh, this process of the policy? Okay. If it can be captured either in the policy or in the bill to bring clarity. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Okay. So, hold on. The, the minister will answer the, the first three questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to start from the last question. Interestingly, when she talked about CAPS, she talked about ITF. If we don't control IGF, and IGF is subject to control through the IGF, Intelligent Generated Fund Law, that must be passed by Parliament every year before you charge. If Parliament doesn't approve of it, you can't charge it. But you are very, very happy to link CAP with loss of IGF. Just as you feel that you should pay, students should get, uh, you should be allowed to collect IGF. That institution also feels it should be allowed to collect IGF. That is why there is a need for a control. You are worried about your students that you have taken IGF from, when they are going to an institution to have their clinical work. That institution has also gone to Parliament to also demand IGF. So if there is no central body controlling it, IGF will prevent your institution from delivering on your mandate, and that institution also from delivering on mandate. And actually, it's a justification for a control on how much is charged by who and for what. Certainly, I'll give this example. That is why you there are some hospitals called teaching hospitals. Those teaching hospitals are so called because they are attached to faculties or colleges of universities that do clinical stuff such that your students can go there to have uh, uh, your clinical training without much where arrangements have been made, without charging. Doctors in Kolebu, nurses in Kolebu, they don't char uh, charge those what you are talking about. But increasingly, every institution is coming to say that government is not providing enough, so let us generate ITF. And it is these same patients or clients that we have to subject them to pay. That is why there's a need for a control. But certainly we can link up and see which institution you are going to that is charging your IGF and what we can do about it. But CAP is in Ghana already. The colleges of education have a common admission uh, application platform, but still the individual institutions charge the admission fees. Just like I said, maybe you came late. The CAP is not supposed to be an admitting platform. It's an application platform where the university will get look at the applications that have come and select its admitted students and report on the CAP. So the CAP doesn't take away your power of admission. It has sent by the regulator and emphasized by my good self. And actually, the vice chancellors of the management of the universities have been taken around certain very good countries that have cap. Interestingly, we learned international best practice. And for years, anybody here who went to the UK or studied the UK or has, has something to do with that, there's a cap in the UK. It's called UCAS. And it's a centralized university admission platform. And there, even private universities are part of it because it makes things simpler and easier. So the cap is not to take away the power of the university to admit, or for that matter, your IGF. To, to, to do. The IGF, like I said, and honestly, people think the IGF belongs to the institution. The IGF is part of public funds, and even usage of IGF is governed by a law. The equity, if you don't put it in law, it becomes arbitrary. If you don't put equity in law, it becomes arbitrary. It is not the first time some universities in this country are answering or trying to address the issue of equity. Uh, a famous professor of KNUSD, uh, Professor Andam, decided, because tech had those courses where you had to be super bright before you enter, like electrical engineering, like mechanical engineering, like civil engineering. And sometimes they had certain courses that only tech did planning, geodetic engineering. And all the schools in Ghana with all the bright students want to enter, especially those who want to do these engineers, entered. When I was in tech, I think electrical engineering department took only about 10 students or something. And just imagine, the sharp boys from Presec, the super brilliant from Prepper College, the ultimate, 
They were always there. So you go into that classroom, the, you go into that classroom, or that lecture room, sorry, that lecture room, and you find 10 students, and they all had four A's. You go back to their O level, probably they all had seven ones. So super brilliant. So Professor Adnan decided that from his own village and his own district, there are super poor people there. And if you don't understand poverty, that's why sometimes some of us are passionate. If you don't understand what poverty does to the human, it, it, it destroys everything. It is not because they are not brilliant, but because of their circumstance. And he started bringing some of these students who had four E's. Yes, they, you will think they don't deserve. And what do they do? Some ended up getting first class in tech. Recently, just a few weeks ago, one of Ghana's girls, or Ghana's girls' school, not extremely top class girls' school, sent a group to America on a robotics competition. Interestingly, we don't teach robotics. The school was doing robotics as an extra curricular activity, encouraged by the teachers and voluntary staff. They went, and that was their third participation in the robotics competition. And the first school to win that competition is probably Prepper College 2016 Toyota Innovation Award. <laughs> when they came to my office, I decided to look at the background of those students. And some had gotten into the school just because of the quota system we have applied to free SHS. Third example, recently a Brie girls had a speech and prize giving day. The head teacher commented on the girl who entered the school with the basic passes. And from somewhere, nobody has ever gone more than what the girl had done. Interesting, the girl was one of the best students in the Brie girls, so the teacher even spoke about the girl as the speech is going to Poverty destroys. And a sensible, responsible government must take into account, uh, make policy directions, and make legislation such that the